My name's Ben, I'm a freelance environmental journalist with a real passion for woodlands and woodwork. Today I'm in uh, Cherry Wood, which is a 45 acre woodland six miles from Bath. We're going to be talking to Tim Gatfield, the owner of the woodland, who's been having a few problems with his local planning authority. Tim, can you tell us a bit about the project and uh, what we can find here? Yep, this is a 40 acre mixed woodland. Uh, it was planted up through semi-ancient woodland about um, 50 years ago. Uh, the, the woodlands run on sustainable principles, so we, we conform to FSC guidelines. And uh, we also have a number of sustainable systems within the woodland uh, in order to promote low impact sustainable living. And when I first started, I thought it would be possible to sort of live up here in the summer and teach courses and then perhaps live in a conventional house in the, in the winter. But I very quickly realised just how much is involved in managing a woodland. Yeah. Uh, and it's a full-time job. Yeah, yeah. And um, you mentioned there about the courses that you, you run. That's quite an important part of what goes on here at Cherrywood, the, the learning. Can you tell us about some of the courses that you run? Yeah, so we've got a combination really of woodland management um, or forestry and then we run the courses. It would be impossible to make enough money from forestry alone in a small wood like this. Uh, 40 acres is just not a commercial size. So therefore, in order to um, pay to do the woodland management, yep. you need another income stream, and for us, that's teaching. Yep. Yep. And what do you teach people? We teach uh, green woodworking up to a fairly high standard. We also teach associated woodland skills like charcoal burning and hurdle making. If you look under the canopy there, you can see how dead it is in comparison to the understory if you look over there. And uh, over there you've probably only got four or five different plants growing underneath the trees. But over there you've probably got 50 or 60 plants, different plants growing. Um, and English wildlife has grown up with coppicing as part of its its um, life cycle and so this kind of dense dark conifer really isn't native to this country. You've run into a few difficulties uh, recently uh, can you tell us a bit about what's been going on in the last few months with your presence here? Uh, yes we've managed quite happily for six and a half years without coming to the attention of the authorities uh, with the support of our neighbours and our many uh, volunteers and people who've enjoyed using cherry wood but uh, we were uh, we did come to the attention of the, uh, the planning authority who sent an officer down to have a look and said that we were we required to put planning in okay and you'd managed to survive that that far without uh, without having planning permission what why did you decide uh, that you didn't want to get planning permission to start with when I first came here, I thought I would try and do it properly, and I did actually submit planning permission, uh, but realised very quickly that there was absolutely no understanding whatsoever of what I was trying to do, and very little sympathy, and the answer was definitely going to be no. Right, right. And what is it about w what you're doing here that uh, the planning authority perhaps doesn't doesn't understand and might be a reason why they would say no? I'm not sure they don't understand it. I think that the problem for the planning authority is that they have no guidance for this way of life and therefore they find it very very difficult to find a box to put us in and so they try and force us into a box which is actually very inappropriate which is the agricultural and forestry dwelling um, but that is the only guidance that they have and so as a result they, they don't have an option. So essentially the policies that they have in place which guide the decisions that they make simply don't recognise the sort of thing that you're doing here, is that about the nub of it? The problem with agriculture and forestry dwellings is that uh, agriculture has always been the richer cousin and there's a list of activities which if you carry those out in agriculture you are allowed to to live on the land. Yeah. There's no such list for forestry okay. type activities mm -hmm. and therefore the planning officers have generally said well trees don't die overnight you don't need to live there. Mm. But of course that belies the huge range of activities that have to go on yeah. in this type of forestry 
And so just to give an example of uh, something that goes on here which would necess necessitate your, your actually living on site, can you give an example of one of those that might not show up on this list at the moment? Um, there's, a, there's a huge range, everything from checking fences to make sure that the deer haven't got into the coppice, through to monitoring charcoal burns as they're taking place, yeah. through to I have an apprentice here who lives on site. Um, he obviously needs some support. Yeah. Uh, people when they visit, we cook over open fires, we use open fires all the time, those have to be monitored. Mm, mm. We have chickens who need to be fed and eggs need to be collected. Okay. So uh, what's the latest on where you're up to in that process now? Okay, we, we applied a very comprehensive planning application um, which went in uh, a few months ago now and determination was due in May, uh, however after visit from the local planning officer. He said that he did not wish to proceed with planning uh, for various reasons uh, and wanted us to go down a different planning route. Which is? Uh, an application for a certificate of lawful use for the current yurt. I see. And um, a lot of people might say, well, if I could go buy a piece of woodland and live in it, I wouldn't mind doing that. What's different about what you're doing here and why, why you think you should be allowed to, to stay and do what you're doing? Yeah, I think that uh, the important thing to my mind is tying the land use to the dwelling. So first of all, the dwelling should be reversible so that if the land ceases to be worked, then it can be taken away. Uh, and second, the occupation of the dwelling should be linked to the work and use of the land. I see. And there's a number of other people uh, around the UK who've been through a similar process to, to you. What sort of outcome did they have um, with their applications? Um, some people have been turned down. Uh, a lot of people have been through a lot of heartache and hardship uh, and struggle to get to where they are. Uh, generally speaking, everybody says the same thing, that the planning does not reflect what's actually happening on the ground. Because planning laws, uh, planning policy in this country has been around since just after the Second World War, hasn't it? So I guess there's a pretty strong argument now to say that given that there's more interest in doing the sort of thing that you want to do, perhaps it's time for planning, national planning policy to be changed to, uh, to reflect the sort of thing that you're doing. Well, we have, uh, as you know, just uh, the new national planning framework has just come out um, and talks at great length about sustainable development but what they've all failed to do is actually define what sustainability is. Yeah. And because of that, uh, local planning authorities are deciding for themselves what constitutes sustainability. Uh, what we desperately need is for someone to actually sit down and say, this is what we mean by sustainable development. And there has been an effort by uh, the Welsh Parliament to do that. Yeah, and in fact, I think in Pembrokeshire they've got a uh, a local policy, haven't they, that specifically recognises the, the sort of thing you're doing. They've, as far as I understand, had fairly mixed results with that so far. Um, what, what do you understand about what they've done over there? Um, they now do have their planning and uh, the policy has actually been adopted by the Welsh Parliament. Right, so, so it's now national? It's, it's now Welsh national right. policy. And what sort of results have they had there so far? Uh, I don't know, um, but We've used it as a framework for our own planning application and it seems to me a good judge of what constitutes low impact sustainable development. Right, right. But and it, and the, the, uh, it's quite harsh, you know, it's not easy to achieve. Yeah. So Tim, when you first came here, I remember you were, you were a single man, probably easier to put up with some of the, the privations of woodland life when you, uh, you've only got yourself to look after, but you now have a family. Yep. Can you tell us a bit about uh, what it's like having uh, two young children in the, in the woods? Two young children who were born in the woods. Yeah, yeah. who were born in the woods. Indeed. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it certainly makes life more interesting. Uh, we've um, grown the yurts to fit the family, yep. so we now have three yurts joined together. Uh, and that certainly is uh, a luxuriously large space compared to a 16-foot yurt. Uh, but um, I think that although it's harder, obviously, living mm -hmm. under these conditions and you need to think ahead and plan ahead much more, mm. 
the rewards are enormous yep. and it's probably not as tough as people think it is. And so what are some of the things that you, you do without which people might take for granted living in a, in a normal house? Uh, well we don't have mains electricity right. so we run on 12 volt um, but that's adequate for lights and for charging phones and any other uses that we have. Yep. Uh, we don't have television but we wouldn't have had television anyway so that's not an issue. No fridges, no freezers? Uh, no we waves. do have a, a fridge which runs on the solar power right. uh, during the summer but in the winter obviously it's cool enough yep. to do without. Got a whole woodland to be your yep. fridge. Yep. <laughs> So we've uh, looked around Cherry Wood a bit, we've met Tim and we've found out a bit more about what's going on here and some of the amazing things that he's doing in this woodland. The, uh, the resolution of the, the planning situation that Tim's got at the moment isn't known yet but it looks at this stage as though he's going to be able to stay even though the full planning permission that he was hoping for which would uh, acknowledge the kind of thing that he's trying to do here, he's not going to get but at least he's going to be able to stay. Mm -hmm.